Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our session, Trust the Currency of America's Digital Revolution. Today, um, we are going to be parsing out this hairy definition of what trust is in a digital world and um, why is it so paramount for us to grow our economy. I want to give a quick welcome to my fellow panelists. And I'm going to very quickly introduce them. I'm giving a little bit of a few additional seconds as we're having a little bit of technical issues um, with one of our panelists joining in. Um, and so I'm, I'm hoping we can parse that out. In the, in the meantime, I'm going to start introducing the rest of the panelists that have been able to join, as well as um, just helping everyone understand what's going to be the structure today. We're going to first be kind of understanding the current landscape of where we are and why trust is so important to the digital revolution. Secondly, we're going to be looking at just a definition of what trust is and what it should be nowadays. Um, and third, we're just going to be looking at ways we can rebuild that trust. Um, please feel free to drop in any questions or comments in the chat. I'll make sure to cue them as the panelists speak. Um, in the meantime, please, uh, feel free to warmly welcome um, all these panelists. So I'm gonna give a very quick intro of our fellow panelists. I wanna start and please wave while I'm introducing you so everyone knows who uh, you are. <laughs> I'm gonna start with um, Stacy. So Stacy, thank you for joining us today. Stacy is a chairman of Asylum Capital, a privately held company that's headquartered in Atlanta. He's a veteran of over 25 years in the finance industry, finance technology fields. He, um, prior to funding Asylum, he was the president and CEO of Hella Storm, a chip design and hardware firm company specializing um, in data ac acceleration. Before that, he was a senior level management position at a few companies, including uh, it, within the finance, risk management, technology, and investment banking fields. He's a frequent speaker um, in different events worldwide, and he participates in the Yale Chief Executive Leadership Institute, obviously here at the Harassas Global Visions, and in the Society of International Business Fellows as well. He is a past participant of the Forbes Global CEO Conference and a Saudi America Interactive Dialogue. So very thanks for your time, Stacey, and um, Next, I want to introduce, um, here we go, Brendan. Brendan, can you please wave? Yes. Hi, Brendan. Thanks for uh, your time today. Brendan, he's an experienced, steady, curious listener with a passion for problem solving at an interest section of business marketing technology for scalable, predictable growth. His value comes from his big picture perspective and unquenchable yearning for learning, self-improvement, and wanting to improve the lives of others. Um, Brendan started this phenomenal consulting company, and he's been uh, helping a lot of uh, 500, um, Fortune 500 companies uh, from his firm in the last decade or so. Um, Andrew is our next panelist. Um, hi, Andrew. Thanks again for your time today. Um, Andrew, he's the CEO of Safely.com, which protects short-term home rentals through an, uh, analytics and insurance. Safely has covered over $40 billion of homeowner liability since launching in 2015. Previously, he was an analyst at McKinsey & Co. Um, travels practice. He holds an MBA from the London School of Business, um, attended the Chinese University of Hong Kong and ex um, on exchange and holds a BBA from Emory University. He currently lives in Atlanta. And Dog just joined. Dog, I'm so relieved to see you here. We've been having a little bit of a technical issues this morning. So happy you could join. So Dog, I'm going to quickly give an uh, intro for you. Um, Dog is a global entrepreneur dedicated to helping members of Global Chamber reach new markets anywhere across metro areas and borders. He's a two-time expat <laughs> with DuPont, DuPont in Tokyo and Singapore with 30 years of business experience in nearly all countries and segments. Dog is a regional advisor of the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition and a member of, the, of collaborating international groups, including Arizona District Export Council. 
He has a, B, a BS in chemical engineering from the University of Utah, an EMBA from Michigan State, and has over five patents. So he was born in Mount Kisco and lives in New York. Mount Kisco, New York, sorry, and lives in Phoenix and San Francisco. So welcome to our panel. Um, Supreet, I'm hoping that you will be able to join um, and are able to re um, iron out differences with a tech uh, platform. I want to give a quick introduction uh, for Supreet in case he's able to join. Supreet is the managing director of Raven Capital, um, and he has over 25 years of experience in the Silicon Valley. He currently serves at uh, the different boards of FinTech, Artificial Intelligence, IoT, and Cybersecurity. Um, and so uh, we're really all looking forward to also um, his expertise here. Okay, so thanks everyone. I'm gonna proceed to give a very quick um, overview of what we're gonna be discussing today. And then um, proceed with queuing the questions for the panelists. The panelists, please remain on mute while you're not speaking so we don't have like uh, terrible feedback as I've heard in other sessions. <laughs> um, and if you want to interject, by all means, just click off the mic and unmute yourself and then uh, join in the participation, join in the conversation. So the pandemic lockdown, as many of you have been listening to in the morning, um, has but accelerated the speed of technological change, right? Our office is Zoom, our classroom is Google, our mail app, our mall is Amazon and entertainment streaming. Of course, even disc gathering is actually possible thanks to technology. Our growing dependency on technology has led many to recalibrate their relationship with it. People really enjoy reaping the benefits of technology, such as increased connectivity, flexibility, access, etc. But at what cost? Tech issues like security hacks, inappropriate or illegal surveillance, misuse of personal data, spread of fake news, um, algorithmic bias, lack of transparency, et cetera, et cetera, are regularly hitting the headlines and feed the current tech lash as a re and result in distrust. Many feel a gap between the individual and societal benefits of technology. With emerging technologies like AI, blockchain, and self-driving cars, there are similarly concerning consumer sentiments as people really worry about job loss and being unable to quickly adapt to new skills and the knowledge requirements that they will need in order to have jobs in like the very near future, five or 10 years down the line. This lack of trust negatively impacts the future of innovation and all the positive transformations that tech can enable. If we take a quick example at where we are in time, um, a lot of the current pandemic could have been contained, contained if we had leverage, better leverage technology for contract tracing. However, many, many people opted not to participate for distrust in government and fear of surveillance, among other things. Um, we really need digital trust to drive business growth and actually shared prosperity in the communities where we live and work. With so much at stake, it is actually imperative that we build, rebuild and rethink trust, particularly in digital when it comes to consumers, employees, citizens, but how? So to help parse this out, I wanna turn over to my fellow panel, panelists. Um, in order to have a very productive session at first, I think it would be worthwhile for us to define what is digital trust and why is it so important, you know? How is trust different now than in prior digital revolutions? Why is it important for consumers, for customers, for B2B, for commerce? Um, I wanna start with Brendan um, and Andrew, but after that, please uh, feel free to jump in. Andrew, you wanna take it away? I sure can. And, and when I think about trust, I mean, first of all, our whole company is built on how do you build trust between internet strangers uh, when they're when they're sharing a vacation home because it's really weird to let you to take your personal home open up the doors to anyone who comes through the internet and then they get to sleep in your bed and use your dishes and like that's just weird so so this is what we do and and i do want to bring up um, i mean we're talking about a lot of 
negative examples, but I want to bring up a positive example of the AI and the screening. And that, that really is, if you look at the old way of establishing trust, uh, and I'll look at short-term home rentals in particular, that's just where we are. But a lot of the, the way you would build trust is not legal. You're looking at, does someone look like me? Are they writing well? Is English their first language? Are, when they send a family picture, does it look like the kind of family that I want to stay in my home? Um, are they handicapped? You, things like this that, I mean, these are, this is how we build trust in the real world, or this is how we make quick assumptions about people you know, from afar before we get to know them. And sometimes that's illegal. And it certainly is not in the public interest to, to make decisions about the suitability of someone based on that. So a lot of a lot of talk about um, you, inherent biases that are in artificial intel intelligence in these algorithms people are building because if you put bias data in, well, it's going to spit out bias data. And, and so in our company, we like to think of it as almost a, you know, a progression. Like, are what we doing today, is that better than what was being done before? And that's absolutely correct. Yes, it's better, but there's a lot of room to go. And so, so what does that next level look like where you really can trust people and trust people or not trust them for the right reasons? Great. Yeah. And I, I guess I'll come at it from a, from a more of a, a, business to business perspective, which is the world that I've been living in since uh, around 2009, when when I lost my B2C business overnight because of the last uh, crisis in, in 2008, and found myself in, in the industry that I'm in now, which is essentially consulting to businesses on how they navigate the chain, the changes in technology that then that therefore change the buyer behavior. Right. So the reason we've all changed as consumers, when you whether you're consuming you know, goods as a consumer or as a as a in, a, in, in the B2B environment, it's very much the same thing. And that and that trust started changing around that time. And of course, was led on the B2C side by by brands and companies like Amazon. But the same thing is happening in the in the B2B space where salespeople who really controlled the B2B environment uh up until about 10 years ago, and it's been slowly uh, going away where they've lost control because we as, as the buyer have more control thanks to technology and the internet where we can pretty much do all the research we need about the problems that we have before we ever reach out to a company or more, more specifically a salesperson. And again, this is where the, the content overlap is. So no matter what kind of business you're in, B2C, B2B, you know, peer to peer, human to human. At the end of the day, we we need to connect. Kind of what Andrew was saying around, you know, what is it that that we need to do in the B two B environment? Whether you're a technology company, a manufacturing company, a professional services company, what do you need to do to to build that trust? And what we do in in B two B is educational content. Which, if you think about it from a sales and marketing funnel, we it's it's what we call the middle of the funnel. Uh, that middle of the funnel never really existed until about 20 years ago. It's only really been developed, and 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 the re and really the reason that it exists is because of nurturing trust. So, and that 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 has just been accelerated, of course, in the, in the last year. And and we're very excited to to help businesses do that because they need the technology and they need the content to continue to build that trust so that they can connect with their with their customers. Great. I'm not sure, Dog, if you there was a comment you wanted to add. Oh, Supreet, so good to have you here. How are you excited? Congratulations. Well, welcome to the panel. I'm very excited that you were able to join. And uh, really technology and the gymnastics you do together. <laughs> As I was saying before, we all love technology, but the technology doesn't always love us back. So I'm very, Congratulations very happy and to welcome. Join. I, I had to threaten my computer that its life hung by a wire. 
<laughs> All right, guys, please continue. Sorry about that. No, no, absolutely. Um, we're just uh, getting to the very beginning of the questions, and we're starting to by asking a very important question to have a, a, a productive discussion, which is um, how do you define trust nowadays in the digital economies and why is it important? Why is it a topic worthwhile discussing? So if by any means you want to pitch in, I think Doug was about to make a comment, but please feel free to dive in. No, no, you make your comment and then I'll dive in. How's that? Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to introduce two other ideas into the conversation. I love what's been said already, but I think there's two other key points, especially around B2B that are, are critical. One is the word warmth and the idea of creating warmth to be, to build trust. And the other one is process. So, so when, uh, the, the first conversation with Andrew around, you know, creating data and a number, you know, I think, well, you know, should I do business with this person? Well, they're only a 6.2. So, you know, what does that really mean? And how do I kind of go from here? And I think from the standpoint of what Global Chamber does, where we're doing business to business transactions, a number like that doesn't really mean much other than it might help indicate largely knows. And now in the yes category, now what should I do next? And what I'm going to need is an understanding of process and warmth. So who are the people that this person has done business with? Do I know that person? You know, that connectivity becomes a process and it becomes a warming of a potential relationship so that I can do a transaction. And so I think those two are key parts of that have always been part of business but they're going to continue to be an important part, even in the digital age. So um, if I can chime in, so, so two components. Um, in non-digital age, trust uh, is about relationship. In digital age, how do you define relationships? So in, in first world countries, relationships are very parameterized. You know, there's legal. Uh, so you define trust by all the protections against antitrust, right? So I have a legal way to sue you in case I don't trust you because you screwed up the transaction, blah, 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 right? Now, if you take that, if you, you know, and globally, if we take the different layers, first world, second world, third world, when you move to the perspective of doing a transaction in non-systemic uh, systems where there's uh, recourse and recovery and, and method. Is your ability, there's no recourse. There's no way to go and say, I need to collect from Supreet the money Supreet owes me because I gave him this, this transaction. We did this transaction. He got the goods. I didn't get the money. And now I'm SOL, you know? So the more places where you set up mechanisms, whether they're legal mechanisms or systemic mechanisms, the, the better the trust, therefore the faster adoption. And in places where they aren't those, it's the slower adoption because at the end of the day, there's going to be a huge amount of disparity between I, the, the relationship doesn't exist, therefore I can't trust you. I'm, let's take informal networks, Hawala network, the Indian network, the Lebanese network in Africa. I'm, I'm African, by the way. Uh, I don't look it. Uh, and what ends up happening is those are the ostracization is so high that you will never transact in the system. Therefore, that's the check and balance in the system. We have to bring that into a digital relationship framework. When we do that, then you start thinking of the revolution will start to get legs, you know. That's where I'll, I'll leave that. Great comments by everyone. Thank you so much. I really love this idea of warm dog. Um, and also this idea that trust has been built um, in the first world, um, particularly via the mechanisms of correcting antitrust, right? Like how much uh, will I get, you know, <laughs> if I do the wrong thing? So, um, now that we have unpacked that question, I think it is important that we start to look at 
what are ways we can redefine it and rebuild it, um, particularly as we look into the digital, the different stakeholders in the digital economy, right? Employees, investors, regulators, customers, the business community, trading partners, governments, and citizens, and how we can all contribute to that effort. I want to just start by saying that in general, the basis of trust, as you were all saying, warmth and or parting tea or sharing bread or vodka, because it really depends on the culture. It is, it, it's, it's the start of our relationship, right? But it is built around reliability and predictability. And I think like any other relationship, when you start a relationship, you're going to trust that person if they show up, if they do the same thing, if they do what they said they were going to do, if they keep up held their part of the bargain. So that transfers very well to digital, what digital trust is, right? And so in general, um, when we think about reliability and predictability as it relates to trust in the digital world, um, we have to think about very basic things. Like we were just living in an obstacle of like, we were trying to get into a, pre a presentation, you were going to be part of a panel, but you couldn't, right? That's a breach of trust if we think about it that way, right? Or if I log into my banking app and I expect to be able to make a payment or deposit a check, if I cannot do it in an ongoing basis, there's a break of trust right there. Um, and so obviously, and you're very familiar with uh, this territory, um, you know, tools in cybersecurity and multi-factor identification, being able to really like look um, automatically at things like suspicious activity or fraud detection, they all help make digital systems more trustworthy and secure and provide what we call predictable outcomes in our business. Um, as well, obviously, as blockchain solution and, and how those help to really is logistics and trade and iron out um, the differences there. So in general, it's what I would call or what Actually, um, Daniel Dobrovsky, the head of government of governance and policy at the World Economic Forum, what he calls mechanical trust. And I would want to give you a little bit of space to, pre to discuss the, uh, the importance of what that is in our digital, in building digital trust, and why is it so important when we break it, and how is it so hard to rebuild when we don't have? It? Is that to me? Okay. Uh, well, mechanical trust is repeatability, verifiability, you know, reliability. It does the same thing over and over and over again. You know, you know, it, it's if your car key would not open your door of your car, you know, and you know, hey, maybe today it's in the mood and it didn't open and then it did. You know, that is going to make you crazy. Right. The I want my car key to always open my door, you know, and that's why. So if you notice, new car keys have electronic systems. You press the little button on the fob, but they have a backup system. It slides out of the car key and you can go stick it in and turn it around and your battery gets dead. You open it that way. Then you charge up your battery. And, you know, it's it's more cumbersome, but it's still a process. So if you think of two or three processes and by the way, there's one piece of this is really important. We're always leapfrogging the crooks. They leapfrog us. They find a way to do something. We leapfrog them with an adjustment. And this is where digital trust, we've got to be at levels where you want mechanical type reliability in a digital space. You know, it, it, it's sort of like when my mother calls me to eat dinner. If I don't go to eat dinner, I'm in trouble. You know, it, it's the most fundamental relationship there is, is mom and son, mom and daughter, right? If you mess that one up, boy, are you in a deep trouble. And I want to create relationships like that. So those are proxies, whether it's mother or friend or like this group here, you know, hey, I just got to know you. Great. Next, we break bread. OK, maybe digitally. Eventually, we'll get together personally. Then we'll decide whether there's chemistry or not. And that's we are creating digital proxies of that process. Patterns and anti-patterns. You want to enforce the pattern and you want to disincense the anti-pattern. That's really fundamentally what you're trying to do. Great, thank you so much um, for, for sharing, Supri. Um, so to just to, to piggyback on that, I think Beyond, as you were saying, this very basis of like mechanical trust, we also need 
relational trust, right? So kind of a share agreement on when, where, why, and how technologies are used in general. So to bring this into focus, I really want to look at the complexities surrounding data and privacy, because of course, this is a really hairy topic in the digital trust and digital economy. Um, for example, relational data and AI can help maximize the potential benefits of the internet. In the case, of course, of Andrew, your company, safely.com, where by creating a trust score for people going to stay at a stranger's home, the Airbnb or BRBO, um, you're de-risking that whole operation, making the transaction in general safer. So as far as insurance technology or insure tech, um, a topic of privacy and control, or in the case of loss of control, is actually central. So how can we encourage safe sharing of data and how can we help citizens and consumers feel kind of back in control? Because I think a lot of distrust comes from when people feel not in control. Who's that for? Andrew, Andrew sorry. That's for me. Okay. Um, we run into this problem, um, you know, pretty often. We um, Some homeowners say they want us to run a background check. Well, we need the name, address, and date of birth to run a background check. So sometimes we have to ask them for that. And they're like, why? Like, this is e-commerce. Why do you need this? And what are you checking? And um, so our adoption has, has been getting, um, has improved, but it's because we explain why we're using it. We're taking this. Here's what we're doing with it. Here's what we're not doing with it. And, um, and at least it's, it's central to, uh, like, they understand why that data leads to what we're doing. And we're fortunate. This is an aspirational trip. Everyone wants to make sure their vacation works. So they will jump through hoops to, to do that. Whereas if, if we're selling baseball caps or just basic e-commerce or, or $20 things, people aren't going to jump through those hoops. So, so like the reward has to be there, but, but the clarity needs to be there. At least they have to at least understand why that data is being used for, for it. Now they might disagree and they're like, uh, uh, this isn't my deal and I'm out. And that's that if that happened too much, then we wouldn't be in business. So it's, it's not happening all the time, but, but it's, it's an area where we really struggle. And right now we're based in the United States. As we move into Europe, there's a lot more sensitivity to data privacy and what can you really use data for. Um, and so we're working on that to, um, to help people me- feel more comfortable. But we're also changing our processes so we need less data because we, those are discussions we'd rather not have. That's, that's phenomenal. And Supreet, I know that you're, um, you're also very steeped in this whole data and privacy and consumer rights issues. So I'd love to hear your feedback on, on this topic and how do we encourage people to feel back in control? And clarity, of course, is one way of doing that. And asking for less data if you don't need it is another way, but I'm sure, Supri, you have a lot more to share. Oh my God, don't get me started. Uh, so the, the, the problem is fundamentally one of uh, standardized process. So we, first of all, I don't believe in, I'm going to just randomly opt you in. I actually want to have permission to be opted in. It's sort of like in supply chains, the push versus the pull. If you create the pull, then it creates a much stickier situation. It's just basic human psychology, what we're trying to use. I believe in opt-in, which I would ask you and say, listen, I want to do this to uh, know you better to create a relationship. And so like single sign on, we'll do this once, but once you're in, you'll be in always, you won't have to do it over again. So now you're creating a transaction that says one time effort, long time value. Okay. There's that. Secondly, if you think institutionally, right, FASB, IFRS, GP, you, you take your alphabet soup of standards that governments are defining, right? And what they're doing, they're really just monikers for I put a stand a stake in there so everybody understands what's a common thing. And therefore, we're able to use that as a standard. You know, next future wave, we're going to go to middlemen, minus middlemen transactions with blockchain. Trusted container. Everybody knows what the container is. You have your key. I have my key. We all open both. You know, this is what I call the bank vault 
you know, thing. Remember, you go to your safety deposit box, the banker guy puts the key in, turns it, you put your key in, turn it. At some point, it opens up, the nuclear weapon blows up. No, just kidding. You are able to then access it. But without their key and your key, you won't get this. What you're trying to do is standardization so you can do this and then repeatability. If you use a standard across the globe and say, we've defined this new gold standard to do this kind of trusted relationship. Now, I don't have to worry about who you are because you got verified by some independent entity. I can just do a transaction and feel comfortable. Fundamentally, I'm ensuring the transaction now, right? And guaranteeing that the parties, if aggrieved, will also follow some form of contractual, you know, back to that my previous comment. But it really is we're, we're creating mechanisms of standardization of relationships over time. Great. Thank you. And, Doug, I'm, I don't know if you wanted to add a comment. Otherwise, I'd move over to the next question. But if you want, by all means, just jump in. You're good. Okay. Um, so, obviously, again, to, to, to keep on this discussion, a, a shared belief that we all are all playing by the same rules, to your point, Supri, um, is crucial to rebuilding trust, right? So, to achieve that, I think what you were saying, Andrew, is like music to my ears, this whole idea of transparency or clarity and accountability is very crucial. Stakeholders in general need to understand what businesses are trying to achieve and then be able to hold them accountable when they falter. How can businesses in general enhance transparency and accountability? And I know, Doug, there's a lot you've been doing in this sector, so I'd love to hear you. And, and I know, Stacy, also, you've done a lot of work here. So I'd love to hear you both speak a little bit about this topic, transparency and accountability. Well, I'll, I'll go first because uh, I, I think what Supreet was saying, it, a lot of it in, in the new digital world, you don't, won't necessarily build trust with your counterparty directly. Uh, this idea of mechanical trust, you'll actually build trust with the intermediary platform. And to the extent that both participants are, are trusted by the platform, that platform could be a smart contract, like you were saying, a trusted container that you know has the agreement in it that doesn't execute itself for all parties until everything has been handled. Or if you're if a, a, an intermediary platform, if you're Uber, you don't need to trust the driver that shows up because Uber trusted him. So and, and he doesn't need to know that you will pay him because, you know, because Uber's handled that that process. So, uh, you know, on the flip side, I've actually been listening to this. And, and I think that the idea, of, you know, we'll use technology to enable transactions where, frankly, you don't need to trust as much. Uh, because there is a enforcement mechanism. And as Supreet said, and as, as Andrew said, there is a insurance mechanism where things don't go well. So if if there's an enforcement mechanism that's pretty good and there's an insurance mechanism where if things don't go well, I don't really care, um, then you can execute transactions without having a high degree of trust. And given the volume of transactions that are that are going to be happening in the digital world, uh, the fact that they will be global, you won't have the opportunity to sit down with someone most of the time, you know, and break bread and drink vodka and all the good things. And I came from that world and it was great, but it's, it's going to be a different world. So technology as it advances um, and will enable these platforms and will enable these contracts and will enable the mechanisms for being able to transact without necessarily having trust. Now that can be taken to a really dystopian extent, for example, in China, where they're coming up with a social score, a social capital score. And if you don't have a, a sufficient social capital score, you can't get on the subway, for example, until you'd go and do a community service and get some brownie points back so that now that you can buy bus tickets and things. So, you know, it, it can go, it can be taken to to a level that, that that's kind of scary. But, um, you know, if we keep it within the guardrails, you know, you, we may need less trust than we actually think in order to transact most things. I agree. Uh, I also think the the one aspect um, that is also critically important here is communication. You know, earlier we were talking about, you know, all of these things happening and a lot of times confusion reigns, right? It's like, well, why do you need that information? What? So, so I think a lot of companies 
if you've ever done healthcare in the United States, you know that healthcare companies are a great example of people who don't listen. All they know is what their own product is. And if you've ever tried to get healthcare insurance, you're on the phone for hours and hours with you know, lack of trust and lots of swearing uh, and, and very upset people, but because they don't care to communicate to you. So the people that will be successful in the future are the ones that are communicating like, yeah, I need this because this and and you have a clear view of how this all works together because you've been communicated to in a way, not just things that you've researched in a book, but they've gone out of their way to give you that sensibility. Right. You know, uh, so so that's a key, key part. The other C word that is important here is connectivity. So I mentioned process earlier and uh, and we already kind of talked through that, but connectivity is really important. So when you sign on to Clubhouse now, if any, if any of it's, if you're global, you should be on Clubhouse. I, I'm a global guy. So I just, I love just jumping into conversations anywhere in the world. But if you're there, you're connect, they force you to do a Twitter and an Instagram, and they request you to do LinkedIn, right? So now you've got this connectivity between various parts of your world and other people's worlds, and you can start to begin to make the connections that say, I'm going to trust or I'm not going to trust going forward. And so connectivity is another key part of the process that we're developing in this digital world that's going to be critically important. Thank you. And I would quickly want to interject, um, Brendan, I know that um, to your point on how communication is key. And I think for B2B businesses to thrive nowadays, they need to over communicate to a certain extent and provide a lot of like educational content. So um, if, if there is, if you could please provide your perspective around that quickly, it would be really valuable. Yeah. Well, I think what's interesting is, I mean, these these threads seem to be repeating themselves as each of us talks and there and we're all saying the same thing but just slightly differently you know whether it's communication you know Doug was was talking about communication and connectivity you know we 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 think about them in the b2b world on, on like what is that helpful content that that needs to be created along the buyer's journey in the b2b environment whether it's whether it's a, a blog article or or a short video or a longer video explaining something uh, again depending on where someone is in that journey those are all part of what's building trust you know in in the in the digital world and creating those connections and going back to what Sapreet was saying at the very beginning that like building that relationship um where you know you, there's there's various analogies, um, and I think Supreet's already used a really good one. But you know where you don't just walk into a bar and ask the first pe person you meet to marry you. You know you've got to go through the steps. You first buy the drink, you watch a movie, you go to a restaurant, et cetera, et cetera. And that and that's what what has to. That's how you build trust. That's how you used to build trust. Uh, you know to Supreet's point, but now you need to build that trust differently in the, in the digital world. And the way you need to do that is you need to, again. Peter Drucker said this a hundred years ago, not quite, but um, where you know you, you need to you need to understand your customer better than anyone else as a, as a business, and you need to understand them better than they do, and so you need to you need to know what they need at each step of that journey as they're doing their research because they're not speaking to you; they're doing all that research on their own, and they're ninety percent plus of the way through the purchase before they've even spoken to your company or a salesperson. And, and that's a critical, a critical piece. Um, and, and again, this is all back to the basics of you're just trying to put them at ease that they're in the right place, that you know that they feel like they can they can keep going along with this relationship. And if and if you do anything that makes them feel uncomfortable, they they're they're out. You know, and and uh, you have no control over that. Brendan, could you explain that concept to the myriad of people on LinkedIn? Uh, the, the don't you don't walk up to the first person at a bar to get married, and don't immediately spam yes. them with your product when you connect. I know, it's, I know. What, what is wrong with these people? Well, but that is part of this world that we're living in, right? That some people. Right. So, just to quickly interject, because we have six minutes left in our panel, um, so I wanted I want to piggyback back on that topic, Brendan, that you were saying about knowing your customer. I think that's really important and almost being the voice of your customer to a certain extent because I think much of the current mistrust of technology nowadays stems from a perceived misalignment between what technology companies are doing 
and like the common good, right? Kind of the ethics behind it and what is good for individuals or society. So I think that building prosperity and making a positive impact in our communities in general and ensuring that the benefits of technology are not reaped by a very limited few, but kind of enjoyed by many is a moral imperative imperative for us all um, to be sustainable and, and balanced growth in general. And so I think to achieve that, there has to be a shared outcome, right, by all stakeholders and ways for those stakeholders to have a say in how these technologies are bound by our social rules. In general, organizations built around customer and employee centricity, to your point, Brendan, again, they're better positioned to build um, kind of build around the shared outcomes and build trust long term, right? So with that, in, with that in mind, how do companies achieve customer and employee centricity in today's increasingly digital world? Beyond all this great content that you were discussing just now, like what are other ways that um, companies achieve customer centricity and employee centricity? So that, that question goes back to me. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, we very simply the way that we look at it uh, here in our day-to-day -day and, and week-to-week is it comes down to to two things, right? It, and again, it's, it's, a, a, it's a repeat of every, everything that we've already said so far in the last 40 minutes, which is uh, it's about the customer experience. And then from a, from a business perspective, again, it's the, the, the flip side of the same coin is operation, internal operational excellence. So, and what we found in the last few years as this has accelerated is that if you solve for the one, you're, you're simultaneously solving for the other. And, and the one that we like to start with is solving for the customer. And, and again, you know, it, it just seems it's the most, it, it just makes the most sense. If you, if you can solve for the customer, in other words, you're building the trust and and you're then let, in, in our case we're building the technology that that accompanies that that customer or that person through their entire journey from being a stranger to an ambassador of your, of your brand uh, again you need the technology that, that'll do that that runs across your marketing your sales your customer and your customer success which is typically you know the flywheel that is that we build around the, the customer and if you solve for the customer and you simultaneously building the technology so that your marketing team, your sales team, and your customer service team are always connected and integrated, uh, everybody wins. And um, so th this is how we think about it is, again, is solving for the basic needs, making it easy for the customer. If you make it easy for the customer, you make it easy for your employees. If you make it easy for your employees, you have very happy, happy shareholders uh, because it typically drops to the bottom line. So great, thank you. Anyone else wants to add to that? We have only a few minutes left. So uh, I think we're doing something. We're in this hybrid mode. We're going from very human centric transactions that were varied across the, but you notice the elements of those, the, the common elements become systemized and, 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 and then they get moved forward to a more systemic thing that does that. Now, we search for things, we find things, we compare things, and then we do the transaction. The way we come back is that feedback loop of customer service, reliability, and most importantly, my bank is a great example. They call me up and say, did you like this? And it wasn't just give me five stars. It's did you really like this and do I am I listening? And the listening component of a feedback loop going back to the designer guys, so they change it, is that element that goes and will create that stickiness in that. You know, trust is easy to lose, hard to get, but once you get it, you know, the network effect of I really had a great transaction is very, very high, very high. Well, I want to take a few a, a moment to thank everyone for uh, your great contributions to this panel. There's so many other topics we could have like just deep dived further into, but I think in general it was a really productive discussion. I really love this idea of building warmth um, and systematizing some processes that will do that, but right. But um, also, how do we, as companies, are proactive? Um, at building that in an ongoing basis via communication and 
a lot of other mechanisms actually listening and implementing that change to your point. Okay. Well, thanks everyone. Um, thanks again for your participation. I hope you have a productive rest of your harasses. Um, and I, I'd love to see you in the interwebs and beyond, hopefully in, in person in the next event. Okay. Keep it right. warm. Absolutely. Yep. Thank exactly. you. Bye. Take care, everybody. Great Bye. job.